There we go. Okay. Now we're recording, so I'm going to share my screen again. Got to love technology. Okay, we're back at it. Um, and before this, I before this job, I was at the University of Cincinnati, so um, overseeing their LGBTQ. Center. So what you see here is just a few pictures about me because I do think it's important for folks to acknowledge um, the experiences and identities that they bring into the work that they're doing, especially as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Okay, so um, we're already going to have folks use the chat. So I'd like to know who is participating, who's here with us tonight. So if you're a parent, if you're a staff member, perhaps a community member um, that is not a parent, um, or if you are outside of our community, just like to get a sense for who is joining us this evening. So if you put that in the chat, and then the other thing is, have you participated in either the first or second part of this series? So it looks like we have um, a couple staff members whose names I recognize, um, parents, um, let's see. Uh, oh, the chat is coming in really, really fast. Okay, a parent, custodial grandparent, great. Um, and a couple folks who have joined the last two sessions. Looks like we do have a couple people who are new. Elementary parent, um, someone said they participated in one of the other sessions, another elementary parent. Great, thank you everyone, thank you so much, great. All right, so what are our goals for this evening? So we have a couple of goals. One is we will define privilege and talk about um, what that means and what that looks like. The other one is um, related to that, of course, understanding the actual impact of privilege, specifically as it relates to race and racism, again, because we are talking about um, anti-racism work. And then we will develop strategies that can support you in understanding your own privilege and ways in which you can use it to be an ally in this anti-racism work. So if you've been to some of the previous sessions, um, then you know we like to frame this around having courageous conversations because we know that um, when we're talking about race and racism that there can um, often be um, a space where it's hard to enter the conversation or to stay in the conversation. And so we'd like to address that with um, what Glenn Singleton refers to as courageous conversations. So the first one is that you stay engaged. Um, so I know it can be tempting, especially when we're doing Zoom uh, to multitask. So if you have the ability not to do that, that would be great. Um, and then that you don't check out, um, that no matter how you might feel about what's being said, that you sit with that and that you stay connected to this conversation. There will be moments when I will ask you to reflect. And so I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to grab a sheet of paper and a writing utensil and do that. Um, and then I'll also ask for you to reflect what you feel comfortable sharing in the chat and questions in the chat. So those are the ways that you can stay engaged. Um, always encouraging folks to speak their truth um, and not just telling the truth, but really thinking about um, what is your own experience. So thinking about I statements and not making statements for groups of people. Experience discomfort. Again, we're talking about race and racism and tonight, um, specifically we're talking about privilege and for all of us, we do have privilege in some shape or form. And so that can be uncomfortable to sit with and grapple with and think about, okay, I have this now, what can I do? Um, so I would encourage you to just experience that discomfort and to think about what the next steps are. Then really owning intent versus impact. As a lot of you have heard me say before, um, sometimes when we misspeak or when we say something that is harmful, the first thing that we like to do is to say, well, I didn't mean it that way, or that's not how I intended it. And regardless of the intent of things that we say and do, there's an impact on the other person. And we really need to think about that, especially when that um, impact is related to race and racism and think about um, the impact is greater than your intention, regardless of the good space that you think you might be coming from. 
And then the last one is to expect and accept non-closure. So this is an ongoing learning process um, and we will not um, talk about all of the things around privilege and, and be done with that. And so we have to be okay with knowing that there will not be closure to this conversation. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is um, watch a video on privilege. And so as I often do, I'm gonna ask you to do some look and listen for, look and listen for. One is something that surprises you, um, something that resonates with you, and then maybe a new realization or new perspective that you gain from watching this short video. So again, I'll encourage you to use your paper to jot down some notes and some questions, and then the things that you feel comfortable with, I'll ask that you share those in the chat. Some people are born into families where they have to walk miles just to get water. All I have to do is turn on a faucet. That's privilege. I think privilege is when um, some people have some things and other people don't have things. I feel privilege is something that you don't even really have control over. I think it'd be silly for me to say I don't have a fair amount of privilege considering like the country I live in and the job I get to do and the college I was allowed to go to. I suppose being a white male will help me end up somewhere towards the front, but I'll take a few steps back from being gay. I don't think I'll make it to the front. I think I'll maybe be in the middle. That's just a gut feeling I have. If your parents work nights and weekends to support your family, take one step back. If you can show affection for your romantic partner in public without fear of ridicule or violence, take one step forward. If you were embarrassed about your clothes or house while growing up, take one step back. If you have ever been diagnosed as having a physical or mental illness or disability, take one step back. If you have ever been bullied or made fun of based on something you can't change, take one step back. If you get time off for your religious holidays, take one step forward. If you came from a supportive family environment, if you can see a doctor whenever you feel the need, if you are able to move through the world without fear if of sexual assault, if you took out loans assault, for your education, if there were more than 50 books in your house right now. So these are your final positions. I think it felt kind of strange for everyone. It's a hard thing to discuss or even reflect on. It was very awkward. I think when you can represent it so visually like this and so immediately, it definitely takes on a new form. Um, I think we were like all joking around in the beginning. It was pretty lighthearted. And as soon as the questions started coming in, the mood shifted immediately. And we all kind of, it was just silent. Just looking back and seeing like a bunch of people behind you is not a good feeling. It's like weird how you want to like hold on to explaining a certain person. Privilege. Like, oh, but that's not actually me because like I had to work really hard for that. So it's it's weird to like take a step forward when you feel like you're taking a step forward with someone else, but you wear a lot of the baggage of like how those things were hard. It was like more emotional than I thought it would be. It reminded me of when they talk about slavery in high school and you feel like angry for a few days, but then you just realize like this is how it is. For me it was kind of frustrating almost to look back and see how much further some people were behind me and realizing that, you know, a lot of that stuff, no amount of hard work or even legislation can make up that gap. It's, it's interesting being an Asian American because you kind of, you're not really sure where you fall on the spectrum of privilege. I know that for me, the, one of the reasons I ended up so far back was that there are questions around safety as an African American, as a woman, as a, as a gay woman. Um, there are just so many different ways that I don't feel safe. I feel like I just learned to be grateful for what you have. You know, we're in such a huge society where it's always complaining about what you don't have. It just shows you that for some families, like each family, you're meant to do better. My grandparents did good, my parents did good, and I'll do even better. I, I do think if you're not like aware of privilege, you should do this exercise, but it's more complicated.
again, I'm going to ask that you um, think about the video. Was there anything that surprised you, something that resonated you, or was there a new realization or new perspective? And I will encourage you to um, jot that down and to share what you feel comfortable sharing in the chat. All right, so it looks like we're starting to get some comments in the chat. Thank you. Please continue to put things in the chat as you feel comfortable. Um, we have one person who said that that was a really powerful exercise. Um, another one said that they've seen this before, but they hadn't noticed how they began holding hands and then had to let go as they advanced or moved back. Um, someone said, understanding your privilege is humbling. Um, and then another person said the realization that the black woman would be last before the video even started. It hurt that I understood that as a black woman myself. Yes. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, she lists several of her identities. We're going to talk about that as we talk about privilege. So I uh, just want to wait another second or two to see if anyone else has anything they want to put in the chat. Okay, so um, for those of you who haven't heard of it, what they were participating in is called the Privilege Walk. And if you Googled the Privilege Walk, you would find several examples of it. And so um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I just wanted to provide some um, examples of questions from the Privilege Walk, just so you had a sense of what that might look like. Um, it looks like, okay, a couple more comments. The African-American woman was at the rear, even though she did not seem as if she were from an underserved community. It could be argued that those persons would have been even further back. So in terms of access to other things, so another layer of identity. And then someone else said that the black woman um, held hands with no one, right? Because she was too far back. Um, so there are a lot of different um, questions not all of them have to do with race because again, this is um, the privilege walk. So it's about all of the identities that we hold. So um, a couple of examples, if you have a visible or invisible disability, you would take one step back. Um, if there were more than 50 books in your house growing up, you'd take a step forward. If you ever felt unsafe because of your sexual orientation, you'd take a step back. So that just gives you a sense of some of the questions. Um, I also want to bring up that there are some concerns with the privilege walk. And so while this can be um, a good visual and a good way for folks to really process the privilege that they have, um, this does rely on the experiences of people with marginalized identities to really help create that kind of powerful learning experience for other folks who already hold privilege. Um, also participants who have less privilege, like the black woman that we saw in the back, are asked to really kind of publicly share some of their experiences um, with other people. And then the last one, um, just to keep in mind, is that for people with privilege, especially for folks with a lot of privilege, it can often feel like um, a kind of shame riddled experience. Um, someone in the chat said, when I've done this in the past, I've been struck by the way in which people often experience multiple traits that result in marginalization. Yes. And we are going to talk about that in just a second. So thank you for bringing that up. So what is privilege? So definition refers to certain social advantages, benefits, or degrees of prestige and respect that an individual has by virtue of belonging to certain social identity groups, okay? So for a lot of folks, especially if you work in the district, you've seen this identity will before, and this goes to um, what the last comment was just talking about. So if you look at this wheel, you know, just take a couple seconds and just name off some of the ways in which you would um, identify in parts of these wheels. 
So you might do age. How old are you? And I'm not going to ask you to um, put that in the chat. Um, you might think about your race or ethnicity. How do you identify? Um, what kind of educational attainment do you have? Um, what's your sexual orientation? What's your family makeup? So those are the things that make us who we are. And those are parts of our identities. And as the last comment said, there are multiple areas where you might um, have marginaliz marginalization, but there are also multiple areas where you might have privilege. And I know, so, and I don't know why this is again blurry on your end. For some reason, Zoom does not like when I use color. So I'm telling you some of the words out loud. Um, so some of the other parts on the identity will include gender, mental, physical ability, appearance, religion, income. So really thinking about um, how you would identify yourselves in those multiple areas. The important thing to keep in mind, which a couple of people have alluded to, is this term intersectionality. So what that means is we have all of these identities that we hold, but we don't hold them separately, right? So when the woman, um, the Black woman was saying, you know, I'm, I'm African American, I'm a woman, I'm queer, right? So all of those identities intersect to make up who she is, right? And so we can't say that you're just one part of the identity. I, I always use the example that when I walk into a room, I'm not just black or just a woman, right? Like I'm always viewed as a black woman and those are two of my intersecting identities. So this is a really important concept as we think about um, privilege and as we, think in a, as we think about marginalization. So a little bit about intersectionality. It was a, a term that was coined by an African-American woman named Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and this term was actually coined about 30 years ago in a paper she wrote as she was trying to explain um, the ways in which African-American women are oppressed. So she uses this as a framework to conceptualize a person or a group of people um, that are affected by a number of discriminations and disadvantages. So when you think about um, voting, right? Like who got the right to vote first, right? So white men, and then even when there was a conversation about women being able to vote, it wasn't about women of color, right? And so all of those different identities um, play into privilege and groups of folks being marginalized. So this takes into account the overlapping experiences and identities that people hold. Um, so she has this quote where she says, a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and it intersects. So you might have multiple areas in which you hold privilege, right? And you might have this one area where you're like, that is an area where I'm marginalized, right? But how does that um, kind of start to balance out? Or how does that play out as you walk through the world? So I just wanted to make sure that we talked about intersectionality because it really is an important term when we're thinking about um, the concept of privilege. All right, so we're doing um, a conversation on anti-racism. And so we're talking about privilege. And so one of the things we want to talk about is white privilege. And so in the chat, I would like for you to put what feelings and or thoughts come to mind for you when you hear or see the phrase white privilege. So I'll give you a couple minutes to, to jot in the chat. All right, so we have some words and phrases coming in. Please continue to put those in the chat. Uh, one person said shame. Another person said generational wealth. Um, someone said there's a feeling of guilt when I think about the advantages available to me based on the color of my skin. Another person said as a white person, it makes me feel ashamed, guilt. Um, someone said that it's not right. Okay, yeah, so as I thought, you know, especially for um, white people, when they see the term white privilege, um, there is usually guilt or shame that comes with that. Um, let's see, it looks like we have a couple more comments. Um, I think one aspect of uh, white privilege, sorry, jumped up, that people don't get is that we, um, 
what we don't experience is part of our privilege and therefore we don't notice it. For example, one of my black friends uh, was a public official in Columbus who's mowing his lawn, the house he owned in Berwick when a white man in a Mercedes drove up and asked how much he charged for mowing, right? So I have been mowing my lawn since high school and was never asked what I charge, right? So he's saying as a white person, no one's ever asked him when he's out mowing his own grass, but a black man was out mowing his grass and the assumption was made that he must be the person who works for that house, not the person who owns that house. Um, someone said all of the above, ashamed, embarrassed, guilt, the privilege of not having to think about race always and all the time. My goodness, yes, yes, and yes, especially not having to think about race. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Thank you all for um, sharing what comes up for you when you hear that phrase, because I think that acknowledgement is really important. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this work that we're doing in the district is not about shaming. It is not about having people feel guilty or be embarrassed. It is about acknowledging where we sit in this work and thinking about how do we move forward from that? How do we learn? How do we maybe unlearn? And then also, um, especially since we're talking specifically about privilege, what can we do to support others by using our privilege? Um, another person just said the ability to drive um, a car without worry of cops, right? So if you have a, a very nice car, um, especially for African-American males, this concept of driving while black is a reality um, and what that means. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, as I remind everyone in all of these sessions, we don't want these conversations about anti-racism and today specifically about white privilege to get derailed because of defensiveness or uncomfortableness. But um, with the feedback that you all are giving in the group, I would say that that is not an issue that you all are having. So that's good. So um, we're going to watch another short video on white privilege specifically. And again, I want you to do some looking and some listening for things that surprise you, um, some things that resonate you in a new realization or a new perspective that you might have. So I, again, will encourage you to jot down some notes and then what you feel comfortable sharing in the chat, please do. what happened here. Secretary Clinton, can you tell us what the term white privilege means to you? Do you agree that there is such a thing, and we've been hearing a lot about it now, as white privilege? I want you to admit that there is such a thing as white privilege. White privilege is a life-easing level of advantage that comes with just being Caucasian in America no matter your wealth, gender, or any other status. It's about whiteness being the baseline or the norm. It's about advantages that are conferred and not earned solely based on the fact that you're a part of the majority group in America. So one early source is this academic paper published in 1988 called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And it described white privilege as a set of unearned and unnoticed assets that white people in America have. They may not be aware of them, but they can assume that they're able to cash in these assets anytime they need to. Of course, the first criticism is always, I may be white, but I'm not privileged. And yes, there are white people who aren't wealthy and there are minorities who are, but white privilege is something different and specific. It's the idea that just by being white in America, you're respected, you're assumed the best of, you're given the benefit of the doubt. And that doesn't happen for minorities, no matter how smart, wealthy, or otherwise privileged they might be. Critics of white privilege will point to things like affirmative action or efforts to attract and retain people of color into elite colleges or into the workplace. And they'll say, look, there's no such thing as white privilege because people of color are taking spots for more qualified white people. But the thing about white privilege is that you can assume that you'll always have a spot. You don't need to fight to be included at the table. White privilege means being able to take over a federal building, to be armed to the teeth, and to threaten violence if necessary, and yet you're still not seen as a threat to national security. In fact, you get to live to tell the tale. 
completely true. So we have a heroin epidemic going on today. And of course, there was a heroin crisis in the 70s and 80s. But back then, the response was to start a war on drugs and drug users, and not even drug users, but crackheads who were black and poor. Today, of course, the response to the heroin crisis is, you know, it's a public health crisis. It's a mental health issue. We need to be kind to addicts. In a nutshell, black drug use and addiction equals incarceration, criminalization. White drug use and addiction equals compassion, concern. So you have white artists like Katy Perry. She can wear cornrows, she can collaborate with rappers, but she's still seen as America's cutesy, cupcake wearing, pop singing sweetheart. But then you have black artists like Nicki Minaj or Beyonce. And no matter what they do, they're still seen as ghetto or angry or oversexed. So what's the takeaway from all this? I mean, one thing to remember is that a lot of this is unintentional. Having white privilege doesn't necessarily make you a racist, but it is worth acknowledging the advantages that you do have and considering that other people might not be advantaged in the same way. Heading into the... Okay. So again, I'm going to encourage you to reflect on that video. Um, was there anything that surprised you? Was there anything that resonated with you? Did you have a new realization or a new perspective? And then what you feel comfortable with, please share in the chat. Okay, it looks like we have some reflections coming in. Please feel free to continue to put those in the chat. Um, one person is talking about the difference between the way white students are disciplined compared to the way students of color are disciplined. Um, another person says, why is it that we hear more about white people being opposed to wearing a mask? Um, that I'm not sure of, so I, can, I can't speak to that. Um, issue specifically. Um, minorities are more accustomed to having edicts imposed upon them. Um, let's see. Oh, and then uh, which was mentioned in the video. So um, Jacob, this says Jacob Blake versus um, the white boy with the AK-47. So, you know, this idea that you can um, legally have a firearm. And if you're a person of color, what has been shown is that you will be more seen as a threat um, and could possibly be killed, um, which is what we've seen play out, um, as opposed to um, they showed some examples of white men um, carrying firearms and not being seen as a threat. Someone said the double standards across every area from crime to entertainment to ed education and work, the workforce is staggering to me. Um, Someone said, I'd never thought about my privilege prior to my late 20s. I've done the most reflection on it um, now in my current position. And I'm extremely grateful for the Parent Institute and topics like this. Thank you. What resonates for me is the word unearned. I get, I get consideration that non-whites have to earn. Yes, unearned. Um, just that the white privilege is just wrong. We are all humans. Um, let's see. Like that's it. Want to make sure if there's anyone else that wants to put anything in the chat. Yeah, I like that um, the last person focused in on unearned. And there's a lot in the chat about um, assumptions, good assumptions for white people, um, needing to earn good assumptions for folks of color, specifically black people. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Yes, so someone in the chat said, it's frustrating that whiteness is the standard to me, right? So often um, whiteness is seen as not only the standard, but the norm. 
And so um, if you don't meet that standard, or if you do something that's different from that, then that that's considered different and oftentimes wrong. Um, I remember in our last um, session when we were talking, I think it was about um, microaggressions um, and we were talking about hair. And so um, people were saying, you know, well, I don't understand why I can't compliment black girls hair, right? And so I was trying to explain that that is not the issue. The issue is that the standard, the norm, the um, standard of beauty is the hair of white women. And so when you're giving black girls compliments because they have now done something to their hair, usually straighten it, that is closer to that standard, then that is when it becomes problematic. So yeah, someone put hair exclamation marks. I feel like we need to have like a whole session on black girl hair because it is a big thing, so. All right, let's see. Um, again, lots of words you do not, I'm not going to read all of this, but um, in that video, they refer to Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. Um, and it is from the 80s. Um, I think I have the date written down, 1988. So it is um, pretty old, but still so relevant. And it's really about, I actually want to read what she wrote. She said, I think that whites are carefully taught not to recognize white privilege as males are taught not to recognize male privilege. So I have begun in an untutored way to ask, what is it like to have white privilege? I have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. White privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and a blank check. So um, that is what Peggy McIntosh wrote back in the 80s. And it is something that we are still grappling with today. But I love this visual of um, this invisible knapsack, right? Like you have these tools, these resources, um, access to, to people, to places that you don't even think about that a lot of folks of color do not have. So there are some examples on here, like there's one on here about, um, I can choose blemish covers or bandages in flesh color that match my skin. Um, that has begun to shift, but it's just been here recently. And again, this was um, done originally in 1988. Um, I can do well in challenging situation in in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race. Um, if a traffic cop pulls me over, if the IRS audits my tax return, I can be sure I haven't been singled out because of my race. Um, I can swear or dress in secondhand clothes or not answer letters without having people attribute those choices to the bad morals, the poverty, or the illiteracy of my race. So all of these things um, that come with this invisible map set. Again, I would encourage you if you haven't looked at it already to Google um, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. All right, so white privilege, again, unquestioned, unearned, keyword, set of advantages, entitlements, benefits, and choices bestowed on people solely because they are white. Generally, white people who experience such privilege do so without being conscious of it. Um, and someone in the chat said that they hadn't really even thought about the privilege that comes with their race until their 20s. So again, this unknowing of what that looks like. Um, oh, someone put in the chat, there's a book called Twisted, the, Tangle, the Tangled History of Black Hair Culture by Emma DeBerry, D-A-B-I-R-I. -I. Um, so I'm going to copy this and put it back in the chat so that everyone can see it. Did that right. There we go. Thank you. Uh, white privilege is having a greater access to power and resources than people of color in the same situation do. White privilege is both unconsciously enjoyed and consciously perpetuated. What white privilege is not, I think this is also important. Um, it's not the suggest, suggestion that white people have never struggled. So um, there is an acknowledgement that many white people do not enjoy the privileges that come with relative affluence, such as food security. 
many don't experience the privileges that come with access, such as perhaps a nearby hospital. White privilege is not the assumption that everything a white person has accomplished is unearned. Um, most white people who have reached a high level of success work extremely hard to get there. Instead, white privilege is about um, having a built-in advantage. So again, this concept of this invisible knapsack, separate from one's level of income or effort. Okay. Um, and so when we, we separate those two words and we think about it, um, oftentimes um, even talking about white can be uncomfortable uh, among those who are not used to being defined or described by their race, right? So oftentimes when you're talking about people because white is kind of the, the norm and the standard, you, you often don't even use the word unless you're referring to someone who's black or a person of color or some other uh, race or ethnicity. And then of course, privilege, the word can be um, especially hard for, for poor and rural white people because it sounds like that is something that they're not connected to. Um, it sounds like a, that they've never struggled. And that of course is not necessarily the case. So one thing to remember is that white privilege doesn't mean that someone does not have difficulty and hardship in their life. It just means that the color of their skin is not a contributing factor in their life, right? So, you know, it, it doesn't negate that folks might grow up poor, they might grow up without access to basic needs, um, but it, it does say that their race will not be a contributing factor um, in their life. So that's something important um, to distinguish between. So we're gonna talk about three um, kind of groupings of what white privilege is, <clears throat> excuse me. The power of normal, the power of the benefit of the doubt, and then the power of accumulated power. So we think about white privilege as the power of normal, a couple things, which um, a lot of folks have mentioned here in the chat. So this idea that simple everyday things and conveniences, um, white people do not have to think about it. It's just there and available. And don't worry, we're gonna, in, on a different slide, I'll give specific examples of these. White people become more likely to move through the world with an expectation that their needs will be readily met. People of color move through the world knowing their needs are on the margins. And recognizing this is a good way for us to recognize um, what gaps exist. When we think about right, white privilege as the power of the benefit of the doubt, um, this is about white people being more likely to be treated as individuals rather than a representative of or the exception to a stereotyped racial identity. White people are more often humanized and granted the benefit of the doubt. Um, and I think sometimes we see this play out in schools when we think about discipline, especially if that, if what the discipline is related to is not, um, you know, something structured. So like if we say they were insubordinate or they were rude, those types of things. And then white people are more likely to receive compassion to be granted individual potential to survive mistakes. Um, and this is a big conversation that comes up when we're talking about police brutality specifically. White people are also more likely to see positive portrayals of people who look like them on the news, on TV shows, and in movies. This privilege is invisible to many. So again, that concept of the invisible knapsack, um, invisible to many white people because it seems reasonable that a person should be extended compassion as they move through the world. It seems logical that a person should have the chance to prove themselves individually before they are judged. All right, and then the third one is the power of accumulated power. And so we've talked about this a little bit in the chat too. Um, so this idea of generational wealth. So that could be around money, it could be around housing, it could be around resources. Um, it also could just be around um, access to different people. Um, and I was just in a meeting earlier where we were meeting with um, members of the Bexley Minority Parent Alliance about a possible um, mentoring program specific for our students of color. And one of the things we were talking about is um, making sure that our students of color have access to 
the people to get them into different doors, right? So that whole saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I'm sure we've all been in jobs where we thought, I'm not exactly sure how you got this job because you're just not that good at it, right? And so perhaps they knew someone that knew someone that put in a good word. And so that is another form of access and wealth that is often afforded to white people. Um, what do I have that I didn't actually earn? So who built the system? Who keeps that system going? Um, okay, so now we're going to look at the example. So the first one was the power of normal. So again, those simple everyday things and conveniences that white people don't have to think about. So we talked about the flesh colored band-aids. Um, again, hair is coming up. Uh, so when you know when you go to, um, let's say you go to Target or to a grocery store and you just need to run and get some shampoo, right? Like uh, black people's hair is different than white people's hair. So we need a different shampoo. There is a a hair section, and then there is usually a smaller, um, it might say like ethnic hair section, right? Um, so the products that white people need um, are just labeled as the norm, just as the hair care. And something for folks of color would be labeled differently. Uh, the grocery store stocking a variety of food options that reflect the cultural traditions of most white people. And then when we think about the power of the benefit of the doubt, again, this is about um, white people being more likely to be treated as individuals rather than representatives of, or exceptions to their race. So white people are less likely to be followed, interrogated, or searched by law enforcement because they look suspicious. Uh, white people's skin tone will not be a reason people hesitate to trust their credit or financial responsibility. And then there is lots of research out there around um, crime and white people versus folks of color. So if white people are accused of a crime, they're less likely to be presumed guilty, less likely to be sentenced to death, and more likely to be portrayed in a fair, nuanced manner by media outlets. And there are several examples of that online too, when you see um, a white person um, especially a younger white person who's been accused of a crime, they're usually able to find, you know, a very distinguished, maybe a yearbook photo, um, as opposed to when we see um, younger African American males who've been accused of a crime, they never can seem to find um, what we would consider to be a good picture of that person. And then the last one, again, the power of accumulated power. So what do I have that I didn't earn? So we talked about the racial wealth gap. Um, specifically generations of white families in Bexley and minimal generations of families of color. And so um, those of us who work in Bexley and those of you who live in Bexley, I'm sure you have heard a lot of people say, oh yes, you know, I live in Bexley, you know, my mother went to through Bexley schools, my uh, grandmother, my aunts, my uncles, right? So all of these different generations who have come through Bexley and you don't see or hear that as much um, or hardly ever when it comes to folks of color. And of course, we know that part of that has to do with redlining and building codes and ordinances that happens. Um, and so really thinking about how that impacts generations. Uh, again, wealth passed from one generation to the next, access to resources, which I've talked about. So access to certain spaces, to certain conversations, to certain people, to certain knowledge. You know, it's not just all about the money. Um, but how do you get access to where the important conversations and the important knowings are actually happening? And then exclusionary zoning practices around city ordinances, redlining, and building codes. So we've talked a lot about um, kind of personal privilege, uh, individuals having privilege, having white privilege, but I just want to mention quickly um, institutional white privilege. So when we talk about race and racism, we talk about it on a personal level. We also talk about it on the institutional level. And so we want to make sure we do the same thing with white privilege. So again, this would be the ideas of policies, practices, behaviors of institutions, such as schools, banks, nonprofits, the Supreme Court, that have the effect of maintaining or increasing accumulated advantages for those groups currently defined as white and then being able to maintain or increase the disadvantages for those racial or ethnic groups not defined as white. And then also the ability of these institutions to survive and thrive even when their policies, 
practices and behaviors maintain, expand, or fail to redress accumulated disadvantages and or inequitable outcomes for people of color. Um, so these are some of the conversations we've been having in the school district, this idea of like, we have to um, make sure that we're educating our staff around racism, anti-racism, microaggressions, implicit bias, privilege. But we also have to address that we are an institution that was set up in a very specific way for a very specific group of people. And so it won't just be about, you know, in your classroom, this particular teacher needs to be doing these specific things, but it's also about us looking at our practices and our policies um, to make sure that um, we are supporting all of our students, um, especially our students of color, not doing them a disadvantage. And so we're seeing some of that work um, starting to happen um, in our district and through our anti-racism task force. So um, we always wanna talk about what it looks like to engage students and young people in these conversations, because again, this is not just conversation for adults, but it's also for our students. Um, so this idea of providing a multicultural education, right? So making sure that students are aware that there are different groups of people who have different experiences. And it's really easy to do that in, a, in an age appropriate way. Um, it also can help students understand how race and class influence their lives, right? Um, a meeting I was in earlier, um, a white parent was talking about how she um, was able to have a conversation with her her son about privilege, right? And like how race and class play out in that. And she was able to do that in a very age appropriate way. Um, burst the bubble. And this is so appropriate for Bexley, right? The Bexley bubble. Uh, so what does that look like? So the acknowledgement of privilege and not just around race, but gender, class, language, sexual orientation, all of the isms, right? Um, someone mentioned in the chat, the connection of institutional white privilege and white male supremacy, right? So um, most of our structures are set up in engaging and um, kind of pushing forward white male supremacy. And so the way that we see that playing out is through institutionalized white privilege. Um, and so we need to be able to talk about those things. Um, as individuals, there are things we can do, but a lot of this has to be um, changed in terms of the kind of structures that we're involved in. And then the naming of racism and classism, right? Like it's okay to engage students in conversations around race and class because there's definitely um, a connection to race and class, but we also want to make sure that we are not dismissing racism and saying, well, no, it's not really about race. It's, it's more about class. Like if folks just worked harder and had more money because race will always, always play a role in what that looks like. And then the last one is that we disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. So this idea that we're talking to white students and young people about their white privilege. Like as a white person, you have privilege and having that conversation with our kids and talking about what that looks like and how that shows up. Acknowledging um, white privilege when engaging with um, students and young people of color too is important. And then attention focused on documenting historic and contemporary injustices. So we have plenty of examples of how this plays out. We have current examples. We have very, very, very current examples of how this plays out. And of course, we have the historical context um, that shows that this is not new, that this has been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. All right, things to keep in mind. The normalization of whiteness and the ways it protects itself are cornerstones of the way institutions function in the United States. We have to acknowledge that and think about that as we're trying to um, improve the ways in which we show up to support students of color. We live, I love this quote, we live in a society where default whiteness goes unmarked. So again, the norm, right? This is, we don't sometimes even name it because we just assume that it is there. Recognizing white privilege is a necessary but insufficient means for confronting racism and increasing opportunities for people of color. Why is that? Because acknowledging white privilege, but taking no initiative to actually own or address it is not only counterproductive, but can also be harmful. 
um, you haven't acknowledged your white privilege if you're only talking about it with people of color. People of color are already very aware of your white privilege. And so when you're engaging with folks of color about your white privilege, you're not really doing the work. Instead, those conversations need to be happening with other white people so that you can do the work. And for staff, that doesn't include me because this is part of my job. So if you wanna engage in a conversation around your white privilege, please feel free to come talk to me. White allies need to talk to other white people who may not see their privilege. And that's one of the, another thing we've been talking about in the school district is um, how do we begin to build a culture in which um, as colleagues, we can talk to each other about what's happening, right? We talked about this a lot as we, um, talked about implicit bias um, last week, I think it was at our professional development day, right? Like if I have a bias and it's an implicit bias, then there's a good chance I can't see it. And so I need to have a colleague who can talk to me about what that looks like and I need to be open to receiving that information. Um, and that's the same thing that needs to happen as we um, talk about and navigate through white privilege. And then you're not adequately engaging the concept of white privilege if you leave intersectionality out of the conversation, which we talked about, um, because doing so has the potential to render other identities invisible um, and it, it negates, it takes away from how multiple systems of oppression works, right? So even if you're talking about white privilege, let's say with a group of students, you still need to be able to acknowledge, you know, even if we think about our own district, right? Um, you know, our district is broken up in three very specific areas, Central Bexley, um, South Bexley, North Bexley, right? And so while the majority of our district is white, we know that in terms of economics, that that looks different um, across those sections and even some in those um, three sections. And so that is something that we would have to keep in mind as we're talking about white privilege. So what can you do? This is really probably geared more towards white people. So. Um, don't take it personally, which we've talked about, or use discomfort as an excuse to disengage. Um, again, when I'm having conversations about race and racism, what I like to say to white people is your discomfort in this conversation um, compared to Black people and people of color who have to actually experience um, not having privilege because of their race or have to actually experience racism is minimal compared to having to live this as a day-to-day -day experience. Learn when to listen, when to amplify, and when to speak up. Um, always important when you're engaging, especially with other, um, if you're a white person engaging with folks of color, that um, you, you let them lead in the conversation about their own experiences. Educate yourself. And clearly, um, that is happening tonight because you're here with us, so I appreciate that. And then again, engage with other white people about you know, the acknowledgement of your own privilege so that you can begin to have a conversation with them about their privilege. And then risk your unearned benefit to benefit others. And so I'm um, gonna show another short clip, which I think really highlights what it looks like to risk your unearned benefits. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white, blue eyes, whiter than most white folks, very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins and we, you know, it's a wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law is in front of me and she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her groceries. Now my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me and I was directly behind her, you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman, is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how you doing? Isn't it a nice day today? They're just chatting up and she says, yes. Yeah. So Kathy writes her, her check and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up, no conversation. She looks up at me, absolutely no, just a little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, is 10, notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check and she goes, I'm gonna need two pieces of ID. 
At which point my daughter looks at me and she gets very, very embarrassed and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye like, mommy, you're not gonna, you're not gonna let her do this. Why is she doing this to us, right? So I'm trying to figure out what I should do because behind me are two elderly white women, right? And I'm thinking, okay, so then I become the angry black woman, right? And they're gonna be, and I just, I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I said, you know, some things you gotta choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check book, all right? So the, this is the book that shows the people who have written bad checks. So she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating, now my, my daughter is in full-blown emotionally upset, who's 10, my sister-in-law walks back over. And she steps in and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well, I know you, you've been, she goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. It is totally unacceptable. At which point the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair, why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. Okay, so clearly, um that video is not recent because <laughs> most people don't write checks, although I still do write checks every once in a while. But anyway, um, but I do think that it is a wonderful example of how you can use your unearned benefits to benefit others. So hopefully that is what you took away from um, that video. So I am going to ask that you put any comments, questions, reflections in the chat. Um, and again, I think most of you have my contact information, but there's my email address. Um, I have a Twitter, a work Twitter page. I'm not sure that I've been doing such a good job tweeting here lately, but I'm going to try to do better. So if you're on Twitter and would like to follow me, I see someone just asked about the last video and I think I have the link. Um, oh, it's the one video that I did not write down the link. I think if you Google a trip to the grocery store um, on YouTube, that is exactly what it's called. You should be able to find that video. So again, um, questions and or comments in the chat. I know a lot of you have been asking them as we've um, gone along. So if you don't have any additional ones, that's fine too, but I wanna make sure that I give the opportunity for that. I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, someone said that the video was powerful. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, someone is sharing that they recently challenged their new boss to improve the lack of diversity in their industry. Um, and they said it starts with him calling it out and challenging his network and colleagues first. It cannot come from me, the only black person on our entire team, right? So again, um, it, you know, he's the boss and I'm, it sounds like he's white since you're saying that you're the only black person on the entire team. So how can he use um, his privilege, not only as a, a white male, but 
as um, a person in a higher ranking position who is probably involved in other conversations that the rest of your team is not in to talk about the importance of diversity and what it looks like to um, diversify the team. Yes, that would be a great way to use, use privilege. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> This is a reminder, uh oh, comments are coming in, screen's moving. This is a reminder that we white folks need to understand and act as if racism is our problem. So right, um, you know, folks of color are very aware of racism, the issues around racism. We're very aware around privilege and the benefits that come with that. Um, and, you know, we could get together and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. But again, we um, are not the folks that are making these things happen. And unfortunately, we're also often not the folks that are at the table to have the conversations where the changes can happen. And so it's incumbent upon folks who call themselves allies to speak up and to do the work and to talk to other people. Um, like them to get this work done. Someone said we have opportunities to, hold on. we have the opportunity to do this when people of color are pulled over by police. At the very least, stay with the person of color until the police officer moves on. Yes, that is an, another way to use your, to use your privilege. And it doesn't um, necessarily mean that you need to intervene, but sometimes just the presence of someone who is not a person of color um, is powerful enough to, to cause a shift in what happens in that interaction. Someone said, this was so informative. Thank you for offering the session. Videos with personal stories bring this work to life. Yeah, I always like to make sure, um, you know, I put all the words up on the screen, but I think it's really important for us to hear other people's experiences um, and hear the real life experiences of how this impacts people in the world. How can parents help students be allies? I think that's a great question. Um, I was just in a meeting earlier this week, I think, where I was saying that I have started to see an increase in students speaking up um, as things are happening in their class and in the school building um, and not speaking up in a way that's like a tattling, but speaking up in a way that's like, you know, I hear the district saying that anti-racism work is a commitment and, and something that they're really working on. So I'm trying to figure out how can I give feedback for things that I see happening that do not align with that. And so I think that students are starting to catch on to I have to speak up um, because we're not always in the classrooms or in the hallways um, to see these things. So I would encourage parents to keep talking to students about, you know, for example, I attended this session tonight around privilege. Let me talk to you about some of the things that um, we talked about. You know, I, whenever I get a chance to talk to students, one of the things I ask them is, do you have a person? So do you have a person in your different aspects of your life that you could go to with concerns or questions? So who are your students' persons in their school building that they could go to to talk about things that they might be experiencing themselves or things that they see happening, right? And so, and I also think that there's enough happening in the news and on social media that, um, you know, those could be great <laughs> dinner conversations to talk about what's being seen and then to talk about like, what does it look like if we say we want to be allies or if we see that people are being hurt or not treated fairly or disenfranchised, how can we as our family um, do something in our own way to make sure that we're stepping up and being allies. Um, when will this recording be posted? Um, usually it's posted on the Parent Institute page by the end of the week, but if for some reason you don't see it, I usually get a copy of it and you can feel free to email me and I can make sure you get it. Um, one way to help students speak up is
Can you all hear me now? That is really weird because I actually was not muted, but it said that my mic had stopped working. Okay, so um, as I was saying, the modeling of behavior is so important for students. So even if you're not engaged in the conversations, if they see that you are not speaking up for other people, or they see people being treated unfairly and notice that you have no acknowledgement of that, that too is a message to our students, right? You know, I'm the mom of a five-year-old and she is already, you know, I hear her say or watch her do things. I'm like, where did she learn that? I'm clear where she learned it. Even if I didn't say it to her, she sees what I am doing. So that modeling behavior is so important. Thank you so much for sharing that. Any other questions or comments? As per the last two groups, y'all have been great. I have really appreciated you all engaging in this conversation, really putting yourselves out there, sharing your thoughts, asking the questions, because again, we cannot move forward in this work if we're not having the conversations and if we're not asking the questions and then being open to um, getting those answers. So I really appreciate your time this evening and your engagement in this um, presentation. So if there is nothing else, you all know where to find me. So don't be a stranger. Um, and again, this is the third part of our three-part series. And so I'm sure my supervisor who is on this um, presentation will be having a conversation with me about what's next. And so stay tuned because I'm sure this will not be um, the last time that we get together and have these um, conversations. Everyone have a good evening and thank you again. Thank you all, you're very welcome. Thank you for the kind words in the chat too, I appreciate it. Good night, everyone.